Now we are going to welcome uh, Paul Bancroft. Paul, can you come on up? So. So like Kenya, Paul is one of our own. He has worked in the movement to end sexual and domestic violence since, since 2008. Um, his, work is in, his work in Tahoe straddles two states, Nevada and California, and is largely a resort community. We have asked Paul to join us on stage today because he has demonstrated an understanding that in order to end sexual violence, the work cannot be looked at in silos. As the dire executive director of the Sierra Community House, Paul recognizes that the lives of survivors of sexual and domestic violence do not take place in a vacuum, but instead, their healing is largely connected with many other needs, including access to housing and food stability and all kinds of other things. So please um, help me welcome Paul Bancroft. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Buenos dias. Como están? Todo bien? Todo tranqui? Todo en orden? Que bien. Okay, andamos. Um, well, it's great to be here. And um, I, I, I got to tell you something. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a call, and it was Kenya myself and Monica and David and Sandra from Calcasa, and we we're kind of going over what we we're going to be talking about today. And Kenya went first, and I mean, we just heard what she's doing, incredible work with Priya, and it was just unbelievable. And I went, and I was like all over the place. And then Monica went, and I just was like, thank God I'm going before her. Um, and you'll get some of that in a minute. But um, it was incredible. So I hung up the phone, I'm sitting there, and I'm going like, oh my gosh, why me? What am I doing up here? between these two incredibly powerful women, David must have it out for me. This is a setup. The joke's on me. <laughs> and then my 14-year-old brain's like, hey, man, you could fake an injury and not have to go to the conference. <laughs> and I thought, well, true story. Well, that worked for a ninth grade algebra final, but I don't think that's going to work for this. And so I stopped taking advice from my 14-year-old self a long time ago, and I'm really glad I did. It's a huge honor to be here. It's an honor to be on the stage. So many friends and new friends out there. So um, thanks for taking a few minutes to listen. So in the short time I have with you, I want to share three stories. And I think these stories connect nicely to the theme of reflect, transform, act. And I'm really interested in the act piece. Uh, one of my favorite mantras is less talk, more rock. So, um, so I'm going to jump right in. So the first story is uh, a while back, I had the opportunity to pr give a presentation to an international delegation from the Middle East. And there were judges, attorneys, um, folks doing child welfare work, folks were working to end gender-based violence in their communities. And I gave the presentation, and it went really well. And then I engaged in this conversation with a, a couple of ladies that were sitting up in front. One was from Israel, and one was from Palestine. And they were both doing work in their communities to end gender-based violence, to end sexual violence, and to end um, domestic violence. And I had uh, so many questions for them. You know, what's it like trying to create peace in the home when you're surrounded by such a high volume of state-sanctioned violence? How does living in conflict zone impact and increase the level of violence? And we had this incredible dialogue. And I asked them, have you ever considered working together? What would it be like to build a coalition? Bring your team together and bring your team together in your communities. Then you could work together to be creating peace in the home, which might lead to peace in your communities. And maybe it'll trickle up to, to peace overhead. Now, I don't know if you can actually trickle up. That seems to defy gravity. But I have the mic right now, so today we're going to trickle up. But um, it, it was really incredible. And this, this conversation ensued. And these two women walked out of that conversation, and they were arm in arm plotting, planning what they were going to be doing once they got home to their communities. And I sat back going like, wow, I just participated in some international diplomacy. That was exciting. <laughs> um, but it started with a conversation. All right, my second story is about two years ago, myself and three other executive directors came together in our community. And there was an executive director of a hunger relief organization. There was an executive director of um, two different independent uh, family Resource Centers, and then myself. Uh, at the time, I was uh, exec uh, the executive director of a domestic violence, sexual assault, and child abuse organization. And we came together to have a conversation around how can we have a bigger impact? 
how could we do what we're doing and do it better? And for years, we've worked really well together. We have great collaborative relationships, like Sandra said. We live in an interesting town. We're up in Northern California. We serve two states, three counties when the weather's nice, five counties when it's snowing and the roads are closed. So it's a very broad geographic area. We have to collaborate well in order to provide services to those who need them. We have to be more accessible. And so we started this conversation, and the conversation led to what would it look like if we merged? What would it look like if we became one social service organization serving our entire region? And I, why merge two organizations when you could merge four, right? And so if you're going to be a bear, be a grizzly, right? Go big, go big. Um, that's how we do it in Tahoe. And so we did that. We got some funding. We had a consultant come with us and help shepherd the process. And I'm, I'm excited to say that as of July 1st, we've gone live at Sierra Community House. We are now one, oh, thank you, it's awesome. We're now one social service provider in our community and it makes us stronger, it makes us more effective, and it makes us more efficient. And okay, granted, this was July 1st, we're only two months into it. So let's all reconvene here this time next year and I'll give you an update. So for the enrollees, you can just roll everybody into the NSAC for next year and it's done, okay? Um, and I'll give you an update on where we are. But here's what I think allowed this to happen. Here's what's gotten us this far. First and foremost, the very first meeting we had as four executive directors coming together, we, put e we left our egos at the door, and at the center of the conversation was our communities, was the people we serve, and was our staff. That never changed from day one. That drove the entire process, and that's what has allowed us to get where we are today. It's about our communities, it's about who we serve. I wasn't interested in inviting hunger relief and FRCs to my table, to the sexual violence, domestic violence table. I wasn't interested in making more space for them. We're building a da whole damn new table. And this table is not round, it's not square, because look at the distance between you at your table. There's still distance there. I don't even know what the shape is. Maybe it's more like a, like a spiral, like a caracol. And at the center of that table is our community. At the center of that table are our staff, our promotoras, our volunteers. And then we kind of fan out in that table. And as the executive director, I'm like in the back. I'm on the side. I'm on the periphery. I'm helping support the building of that table. But my goal is, you know, if I decide I'm going to step away and, I don't know, I'll go work at a bike shop and grow a beard and drink microbrews, because I think that's what my tribe does. Um, then I can do that, and that table's gonna be okay. The table's gonna be thriving. It doesn't need me anymore, because it is centered on our community. They are building this organization. Our staff are building this organization. I get a lot of questions about, um, well, what about the other EDs? So I'm super honored to be the executive director of this other organization. Well, that leaves three other executive directors. Where are they? They're at the same organization. They're still working. In fact, they're in positions now that they're actually working into their strengths and they're thriving and they're in positions that they really love. Not everybody loves being an executive director. It's got a lot with it. Um, we were able to pull up all of our staff. We used the Northern California Nonprofit Survey and pulled everybody up to a living wage, including entry level, promotoras, um, part-time, full-time. Yeah, it's so exciting, you guys. We, one of the organizations didn't provide health care or any benefits. Everybody now who qualifies has access to health care, has access to their 401k. It's really exciting. We're investing in our staff, which means we're investing in our communities. And um, so that's really exciting. All right, last story, promise. Um, Last year, early November, we had our annual fundraiser, and it was our, our biggest one ever. We we're all super excited. For us, we, we raised a bunch of money, and normally what happens is we'll have our big fundraiser in November, and then we do our annual appeal, and that goes out via snail mail and, and the internet for end of the year appeal. And so we had our event, we did really well, and then my staff are saying, hey, you, you got to start writing the appeal. We got to get this going. We got to do the mailer and all that. And normally I really enjoy this process because I can talk about the successes of the year. I can articulate our vision for the coming year. But for some reason, I couldn't do it. I, I just was dragging my feet and I couldn't figure out why. Well, at the same time that this was happening, so was the campfire up in paradise. Does everybody remember the campfire? Totally devastating, catastrophic wildfire event that occurred up in Paradise, California. Killed nearly 90 people, almost wiped an entire town off the map. 
And I, I was just really struggling with, with writing this letter, and I, I wasn't sure why. And then I had one of those 2 a.m. epiphanies. I wish those happened more. It's very rare, but I, I did have one at this point. And I realized I can't ask my community for more money knowing how much suffering is happening in paradise, how much suffering is occurring to our brothers and sisters up north in paradise, which is not far from us. It was at that moment I was able to write my appeal letter. And in my, in my appeal, I made the connection of climate change to catastrophic wildfires in California, to victims and survivors and the impact of domestic and sexual violence as a result of climate change. Totally different direction than what my appeal normally would have been in. And I presented that to my staff and they're like, whoa, man, like, this is way too political. And I said, no, it's not. This is, this is reality, this is what's happening. We have to name it and we're gonna go out with it. I showed it to my board, and they're like, yeah, you're nuts, but we're used to that. And um, <laughs> so, um, and, and my appeal to them was, like, look, I, I live in the forest, and where I live, uh, if we had catastrophic wildfire in Tahoe, it would be absolutely devastating, so that could be us, but it was the right thing to do, and you know what we did? Half of the money we raised for the appeal went to campfire victims, and I know that's not normal, <laughs> and I know that's not how we normally do it. And it might be a far stretch to connect climate change to the prevention of domestic violence and sexual violence and connect, make that connection to climate justice. But, in fact, I would argue that all of our missions are connected across the entire social justice spectrum. If our missions, if we have rooted in our missions love, compassion, <laughs> dignity, and community, then our missions are interwoven, our missions are connected, and we have to work together as such. So. I believe that if we are going to effectively end sexual violence in our communities, in our state, in our country, in our world, we have to take some steps. We have to act. And it might start with a conversation, a dialogue with somebody who you might not normally want to have a dialogue with or you might not really be poised to do that with. Maybe it's an adversary. Maybe it's someone who causes harm. Maybe they are uh, someone from an oppressive system in a white supremacist society but we have to have those dialogues, we have to have those conversations and find that common ground. We have to find our common humanity together because if we can transcend uh, our limited beliefs, then anything is possible. For service delivery, we've got to be able to break down our silos and work together. We have to come together with other providers in our communities, unify, work together, because the people who come to us, the people we serve, they are whole beings, therefore our systems have to be holistic. We have to address people as whole beings. And, and last, I would say, we have to make connections with other movements. Our missions are interwoven. If we can make the connections, then we can have more context, we can have more impact in our work together to build community. So I wanna leave you with a quote, and um, I had to borrow this book from my daughter, who's seven. This is my favorite children's book, for adults, it's called What Do You Do With An Idea? And on the last, and it's about a, it's about a young girl and her idea. And, and I think this is relevant for today. On the last page, her epiphany, maybe this is her 2 a.m. epiphany like mine. And then I realized what you do with an idea. You change the world. Let's change the world. Thank you. Thank you.